One after another, strange objects began appearing on the tables of Middle Eastern marketplaces in the 1920s. They contained weird, almost alien-looking symbols that no vendors or shoppers had ever seen. Those symbols were not alien. They were from a civilization that had been lost until the 1880s. They were symbols of an ancient empire. No, not Egypt. They were from a much older empire that had an even more significant impact on history. The symbols, which we now know as cuneiform writing, were from not only the first known empire, but also one of the first known civilizations, the Sumerians. The rise of the Akkadian Empire, which united the Semites and the Sumerians, was a stark turning point in Mesopotamian history. Its influence would echo throughout the centuries and cultures, influencing conquerors and world powers alike. Thousands of years ago, a civilization emerged from between two great life-sustaining rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris, a region known as the Cradle of Civilization. Sumer was located in an area that the ancient Greeks called Mesopotamia and is known as Southern Iraq today. For the most part, the origins of the Sumerians are a mystery. Still, their civilization was a powerhouse of science, mathematics, engineering, architecture, and art, and the birthplace of the first written language. Stories from the civilization, both true and fictionalized, live on as legends thousands of years later. Their knowledge, culture, and writing system were the foundations of an empire, the Akkadian Empire. Though they shared a common region, writing system, and ancestry, likely Semitic, the Sumerians were not a cohesive civilization. Sumer was composed of numerous city-states, most of which were sovereign entities. Each would have a king of its own, but evidence shows that there was perhaps at least one ruling queen. Religion was an integral part of the civilization, and the people built their lives around it. Each city-state had its patron god or goddess, which the people believed protected the city and ruled over their affairs from the heavens. A ziggurat, or pyramid-like temple, dominated the landscape of each city, making it impossible for eyes not to be drawn to its immense size and significance. So, how did these disparate religions, landscapes, and city-states come together to form an empire? That story begins with Sargon the Great, who lived between the 24th and 23rd centuries BCE. After putting Sargon in a waterproof reed basket, his mother put him in the waters of the Euphrates River and pushed him out into the current letting it carry him downstream to wherever fate might take him. A palace employee in Kish, a man named Aki, had gone down to the river to collect water when he saw the basket. Perhaps he heard the child's pathetic cries, or maybe he was curious to see what was in the mysterious basket. But when he found the child, he took him home and raised him as his own. The story's parallels to a certain famous tale in the Abrahamic tradition, the one about Moses, are evident. The boy grew up around the palace where his adopted father worked, and when he grew old enough, he became employed as a gardener for the king. Found at the library of Ashurbanipal in the ruins of ancient Nineveh, the legend of Sargon reads, My mother was a changeling, my father I knew not. The brother of my father loved the hills. My home was in the highlands where the herbs grow. My mother conceived me in secret. She gave birth to me in concealment. She set me in a basket of rushes. She sealed the lid with tar. She cast me into the river, but it did not rise over me. The water carried me to a key, the drawer of water. He lifted me out as he dipped his jar into the river. He took me as his son. He raised me. He made me his gardener. The boy kept climbing the ranks until he stood next to King Ur Zababa as his cupbearer. Meanwhile, King Lugal Zagazi, the ruler of Uma, was sweeping through Sumer on a path of conquest. He sought to unite the disparate city-states throughout the region and had the most successful military campaign to date. His plan was working, and aside from gaining power, he was gaining control over much sought-after fertile soil and water sources. Down went the city of Lagash, followed by the conquest of the great city of Uruk. Eventually, only Kish in all its glory remained unbothered. Afraid of a presumed prophecy, Ur Zababa had attempted to kill Sargon on multiple occasions, but failed. So, Sargon joined Lagal Zagazi, entered Kish with him, and enjoyed the victory over his former king. Sargon saw the disaster that had befallen his city as an opportunity and made plans to grab it. While Zugal Zagazi remained in Kish, triumphantly celebrating his victory, the cupbearer reunited the soldiers of Kish. 
It is unknown what Sargon's relationship with ur zababas army was like, but if he had been carefully nurturing its loyalty, this was the perfect time to put it to use. The cupbearer, loyal to no one, would end up following in Lugal Zagazi's footsteps, for he would continue the conquest of other city-states. However, he was not simply content with taking control over Sumer. He wanted to conquer the known world. He would start by striking at the heart of Lugal Zagazi's conquests, Uruk. Sargon and his army captured Lugal Zagazi, took him prisoner, and paraded him in the streets of Nippur. Immediately following his victory over Lugal Zagazi, the cupbearer pronounced himself king and took on the new name Sargon, meaning legitimate king or rightful ruler. The original legend and other early texts of Sargon's rise to power read like mythological stories. It is probably no accident it was written that way, as Sargon was its author. However, how Sargon built the rest of his empire is better recorded and more founded in reality. But even that story is quite legendary. After conquering the cities of Sumer, clustered within a relatively small area, Sargon saw there was not enough glory in that. To strive for greater treasures, Sargon needed a base, a capital from which to launch his empire-building campaigns into far-flung regions. He settled on building, or possibly even rebuilding, the city of Agad, known in Hebrew as Akkad. Once his city was built, Sargon set his sights beyond Mesopotamia. After creating the first standing army known in history, he took his trained fighters and crossed the Tigris River and the rugged terrain of the eastern mountains into Elam, a place no Sumerian army had ever gone. Thus Sargon conquered King Awan and the three other leaders of Elam and their cities, bringing them under Akkadian control. He continued north toward the Caspian Sea, capturing lands of various Semitic tribes like the fiercely wild and nomadic Amorites. He and his army then turned west and continued conquering past the Tigris and through the famed cedar forests of Lebanon to the sapphire waters of the Mediterranean Sea. From there, by his account, Sargon crossed the sea and conquered the island nation of Cyprus. Once back in the mainland, he and his army pushed farther north toward the silver heights of the Taurus Mountains in Turkey. He pressed his armies to continue farther west, deeper into Anatolia, but it was here that Sargon hit the metaphorical wall. After 34 battles, his men had had enough. Forcing the men to continue against their will, past their limits, would not preserve their much-needed loyalty to him. So Sargon returned home. After his victories, Sargon is said to have washed his weapons in the upper and lower seas, the Mediterranean Sea and the Persian Gulf. This act was largely symbolic, a ritual cleansing. It signified that he had reached the end of the world and that there was nothing left to conquer. Sargon's military campaign, however, had not been all mayhem, carnage, and the piling up of bodies. In Asia Minor, the people of Perush Kanda sent him a message asking for his help against their cruel and oppressive king, Nur Dagan. Sargon smartly stabilized his vast new empire by ensuring it was unified, well-organized, and well-connected. So, he constructed roads, made crucial trade routes more accessible, and secured significant trade routes on land and by sea even claiming to have sent ships as far as India. With those all-important trade routes under his control, Sargon had the wealth of various parts of Mesopotamia within his reach. His trade route system also paved the way for wood and precious metals to be sent down the rivers to Akkad. A new standard for weights and measures was established, along with a state-run tax system that would keep local corruption to a minimum. He improved irrigation, which helped prevent drought and famine. Like any good ruler, he ensured that the weak, mainly widows and orphans, were protected. He kept the corners of the empire in touch by establishing a postal system. Under Sargon, the kingdom became united under one official language, Akkadian. He brought a variety of languages, cultures, and lands under the umbrella of one empire and one supreme ruler. He spearheaded a new way of doing things, breaking the old order and creating a new one. But these reforms did not go over well. The working class people of the empire admired him. To them, he was a heroic liberator and a masterful reformer. The ruling elite, however, did not have such rose-tinted glasses. Besides losing high positions, there were other reasons the conquered Sumerians were offended. They had not achieved their positions through merit and hard work. They believed the gods divinely appointed them. Royals came into their designations by the right of bloodline inheritance. Dismissing the Sumerian rulers was an affront to those rights. 
And no matter how fair Sargon was on other issues, this type of sacrilege could not be tolerated. With this type of resentment simmering, Sargon needed to take steps to protect himself and legitimize his rulership. He created the first known class of soldiers called Niskum, a group comparable to royal guards. Once Sargon had loyal vassal rulers and a trusted royal military, he still needed something to further cement himself into his new position. Despite the differences in language and culture between the Sumerians and the Akkadians, religion was one thing on which they could essentially agree. So, by mixing his rule with religion, he could theoretically create a more seamless transition for his dynasty. He connected himself to the supreme deities of the Sumerian and Akkadian pantheons, Enlil and Ishtar, with the latter being the Akkadian counterpart of the Sumerian goddess Inanna. It was much easier to phase out an entire political and cultural identity when the people thought it was the god's will. But though Sargon was slowly wiping away traces of Sumerian culture and systems and replacing them with Akkadian ones, the Sumerians did not forget that their once great culture existed. As can be imagined, many of them did not take too kindly to suddenly becoming foreigners in their cities. However, no matter how good Sargon had been or how well he had implemented this plan, boiling resentment created cracks in the foundation that held the empire together. The Dam of Revolt eventually broke near the end of his reign. Sargon was probably around 70 years old when he rode out to oversee the rebellion-crushing campaign. In a series of revolts, the deposed authorities of Kish barricaded themselves in the Temple of Inanna at Kish in protest. Sargon naturally claims to have quashed the rebellion immediately. However, other uprisings may not have been put down so quickly or easily. Later Babylonian chronicles paint a completely different picture of what happened. In 2279 BCE, the fight was over for Sargon, who reportedly died of natural causes. But the king's death did nothing to quell the raging rebellions. Sargon's sons and successors, Ramush and Manishtushu, could not hold the empire together. Subsequent rulers failed to measure up to the legend of Sargon, and the Akkadian Empire fell in the 22nd century BCE around 200 years after its birth. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history, impress your friends, and predict the future more accurately based on past events? If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about the Akkadian Empire, check out our book, The Akkadian Empire, A Captivating Guide to the First Ancient Empire of Mesopotamia and how Sargon the Great of Akkad conquered the Sumerian city-states. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.